All right, hi physicists. Um, I'm going to do a little video here just to, to go through how to derive the critical density of the universe using conservation of energy. Um, to do that, we've, we've first got to have a pretty good handle on the concept of escape velocity. So that's where I'm going to start. Um, what does escape velocity mean? Why does it exist? So uh, let's consider a planet or some other object with large mass. Sorry, that was supposed to be a circle. It doesn't really matter. Um, and on the surface of it, a, a smaller object with a, a smaller mass. If my planet has a radius of r, I know that when this object is on the surface of the planet, it has gravitational potential energy um, given by this formula, gmm over r. Notice that it's negative. Um, so if I plot the gravitational potential energy uh, as a function of how far away I am from the center, from how far away I am from you know, treating this as a kind of point mass here, r. Uh, this is a minus one over r. So something like that, tending to zero, but technically never reaching it. Uh, this is my energy. This is my gravitational potential energy. So here's the surface of my planet. And here is the energy of this object when it's on the surface. If I project this object up away from the planet with some speed v, I am giving it kinetic energy, half mv squared. No problem there. So let's imagine a few eventualities. Let's imagine that half mv squared is smaller than this. That means that the total energy, that the combined sort of kinetic and gravitational energy that this object has is u plus ek. Uh, and that is a half mv squared minus gmm over r. If that is less than zero, let's say uh, that would mean that a half mv squared is smaller in size than gmm over r. Let's imagine I give the object this much energy. Then this is where it gets to. It gets to this height. That's its height above the surface. And then it falls back down because remember the gravitational force is given by the gradient of this graph. So there is a gravitational force on it and that force would be directed back towards the planet. So if a half mv squared is smaller in size than this, it does not uh, escape, it falls back down. That's the example where this total is still less than zero. It still has a negative total energy. Now let's back it up. And let's think about the case where I give it more kinetic energy than that. Imagine I give it so much kinetic energy that this is greater than or equal to zero. So imagine I give it either exactly this much energy or perhaps even this much energy. What does that mean? Um, well, that means that the total energy, if it's equal to zero, this object is able to reach the point where this graph becomes flat. Um, where does that happen? You know, as I said, technically this approaches zero, but it never quite gets there. So we can just say that that happens at infinity, if you like. I know that infinity doesn't, you know, exist as a kind of number, but R certainly tends to infinity as my total energy tends to zero. And weirdly, if my total energy is greater than zero, then r is greater than infinity. What that means in real terms, because this is obviously a nonsense statement, what that means in real terms is that my object is free. It is never going to fall back down again. It's not coming back. I've projected it from the surface with a velocity v, and v is so large that this will escape the gravitational pull of this object completely, and it will never come back. So with that in mind, the critical point is where the total energy is equal to zero. That's the critical point here. So if I do some maths on that, um, quick maths, easy maths. Uh, if I say that's equal to zero, then what I'm saying is GMM over R is equal 
to a half mv squared. Uh, I can ditch the m's. It does not depend on the mass of the object that I'm projecting, but it does depend on the mass of the object, the large object that's doing it, the attracting, and it does depend on the radius that I start at. So what I end up with is that the velocity that I have to project an object at is 2gm over r, all square root. This is skip velocity. By conservation of energy, that's the speed that I have to launch something off, for example, the surface of a planet, for it not to fall back down again. That's what I've got to do. Um, by a reverse argument, that also means if something falls into this planet from effectively infinitely far away, that's the speed that it hits the surface at, assuming it didn't have any initial velocity. So that's what we mean by a skip velocity. What's that got to do with density of the universe? Well, the way that we determine that is to consider a random sphere of universe. I was hoping that would just automatically turn into a circle and it totally hasn't. Um, come on, whiteboard, you, you can do this. No, <laughs> really? Oh, there we go. <laughs> what? Um, let's consider, I wanted a bigger sphere though. Give me a big sphere. It's not gonna. Um, this is a big random sphere of universe. I don't really care uh, where it is, but it's big. It's big enough that we can consider it to have a mean density. So this is a huge sphere of universe, of radius r. Here is a point in the middle of that sphere. Um, we can say that the volume of this sphere, is a sphere after all, is four thirds pi r cubed. No problem there. The mass of this sphere is therefore that volume multiplied by the density of the universe. And that's why we need to consider a large sphere because the density of the universe on any small scale is not consistent. Um, you know, the density in a solar system is not the same as the interstellar medium. The density within a galaxy is not the same as the intergalactic medium. So as long as our sphere is really large so that there are like galaxies and stuff within it with a pretty normal spacing, we can, we can just take this to be the mean density of the universe. So that's the mass it has. Now we'll consider any object that's on the very edge of this sphere that we're considering. Bear in mind, this is not the whole universe, it's just a random sphere. According to Hubble's law, this point will be uh, receding from the center of the sphere. Not only is it receding, we can say that it's got a velocity, Hubble's law says this, uh, therefore the velocity of this point is equal to h naught r. That's how fast it's going. So let's just remind ourselves, now we've got a velocity and we've got a mass, let's just remind ourselves of the stuff that we're talking about up here. Um, what we did was we equated the kinetic energy of that object to its gravitational energy to find out the critical speed. This time we want to do the same thing, but instead of finding a critical speed, we're gonna find a critical density, the density at which this point will fall back. So let's give this a mass m. Uh, remember from previously that the mass of the object we consider actually doesn't matter. The, the final value that we get is independent of that mass. So what we're considering here, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't have to be an object at all. It's just a point, but uh, it makes it easier to get our head around if we just consider this to be, you know, maybe a galaxy, whatever. So um, this, must be true at the critical point. Uh, now all I've got to do is substitute in my expressions and hopefully I can do a bit of faffing about um, a little bit of cancellation and end up with something that tells me the critical density of the universe. So first uh, I'll cancel out those m's before I go any further because they don't matter. So gm 
I've got uh, 4 over 3 g pi r cubed rho over r equals a half inch naught r squared. So straight away, uh, this cancels with this to give me an r squared, which means I can cancel that and that. Um, I can double both sides to get rid of my half, and I have it over 3 g pi rho. This is now, I'll, I'll put a subscript c to show that this is now the critical density that we're considering. Equals h naught squared, and I'm pretty much there. Rho c, therefore, 3 h naught squared over 8 pi g as the critical density of the universe. Um, and this expression, unsurprisingly, ends up independent of the mass that we considered at the edge. Um, so that feels pretty good. It is not um, it is independent of the radius of the sphere that we chose um, and therefore of the mass of the sphere that we chose as it should be. The only thing that's important is that this density must be a reasonable measure for the average density of the universe. And, you know, therein is the problem. That's why we can't really decide if the universe expands forever or collapses again um, until we know that density. We can't know that density until we know how much uh, of the mass of the universe is kind of contained in dark matter and all of those types of things. Anyway, uh, that's how we derive this expression. Hopefully uh, that's been helpful. Any questions, chuck them in the comments and I will attempt to, to answer them.